And we're back with actually two of my favorite bleeding hearts sitting at the table with me. <laughs> Denise Mayes from the Colorado ACLU. Denise, how are you today? I am well, thank you, Great. Mike. Terry Hurst from the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coali yes. Coalition. Coalition, Terry? yes. Yep. Thank you for, for letting us be here today. Uh, I'm um, not sure which one is more of the bleeding heart, but we're happy to be here with you. <laughs> Fantastic. Exactly. All right, first, so first, let's do this. So the ACLU, of course, is a, a, a established, nationally branded civil rights organization. Mm -hmm. So politically astute people and people high high knowledge voters obviously already know at the ACLU's, but you're with the Colorado chapter, mm -hmm. which same mission, but focused on Colorado as right. it relates to the mission. Right. Is, that, is that a fair assessment? That's of, a fair assessment. We just promote uh, civil liberties for all of Colorado. All right. And Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition is a different animal because you are a Colorado specific organization. Uh, and you're also small. I think you operate out of some guy's second bedroom, right? <laughs> Pretty much. All I right. mean, so we're a staff of four. Right. Um, we are a small nonprofit, 501c3, that began in 1999. So our mission is to end mass incarceration. Give me, give me, give me the, give me the one-minute elevator pitch you might throw at somebody to explain what the heck you do. I would say that again, we uh, we work towards ending mass incarceration. That we have an over reliance on the criminal justice system, and our organization tries to change policy to help reduce the amount of people involved in the criminal justice system. And we also ask act as a resource for people and their families that have been impacted. Fantastic. All right. So we're, look, we're, in this legislative session, so you ACLU has an interest in criminal justice issues. True. Obviously, you do. It's right, right in your name. There's this interesting little sub-theme running through some bills in this year's legislature. They're not big, sexy themes, so they don't get a lot of attention. But, but the theme, at least from my perspective, and tell me if I'm wrong, the theme seems to be there's some bills that put the, the, the safety and well-being of some first responders, police, and healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. and the privacy and dignity of victims, mm -hmm. ahead of kind of this idea of let, let's just make everything prosecutable and hope that the DAs exercise their discretion. Is, is, for the bills we're going to cover here, is that makes is that, that makes you agree? Sense. Yes. I think that's exactly All right. right. Well, then mm -hmm. let's jump in and talk about these bills because both of your organizations support these bills, right? Mm -hmm. You're yes. both on board with these? All right, yes. great. So they both, they've all gone through the Senate, heading into the House. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right, so first off, we're going to start off with uh, uh, SB 30, uh, Prostitution Defense for Human Rights Trafficking. And this is uh, Morgan Carroll and Bill Cadman's bill. Mm -hmm. So you have the former state Senate president right. and the current state Senate president co-sponsoring mm -hmm. a bill together. What's, what does this thing do? Well, basically, it uh, allows victims of human trafficking to raise the fact that they were in human trafficking as an affirmative defense to being charged for prostitution. Um, I mean, there's a lot of um, both men and women that are part of a human trafficking ring, and they are coerced into prostitution, and this allows them an affirmative defense. I mean, the you know the the real simple charge of prostitution, you just fulfill the elements, and you're you're done. But this at least allows for an affirmative defense, which, uh, which had not been permitted before. Okay, so let me see if I got this straight then. So the cops do a, a, a sting, mm -hmm. and they bust some Johns, and they bust some prostitutes. And the prostitute says, well, I'm, I've been coerced into the sex trade by traffickers. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, well, you know, t tell it to your lawyer, and you can still be charged for the prostitution, yes. despite the fact that you were coerced into Correct. the sex trade. This, and so that actually can happen now, mm -hmm. right? Correct. All right, mm -hmm. so this bill would undo that. It would give the, 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 either the, the prostitute, the person who engaging in the sex trade, an affirmative defense to say, look, I was coerced into this. It wasn't my idea, right? Right, and, and, right. And please don't, uh, you can't, I can't be charged. Is Correct. That, is well, that you would still be charged you initially. You just have to prove, prove yes. that you were a victim of a sex trafficking. Yes. And you were talking about before the show that, that the, there's, a, there's a little glitch in here, though, with regard to how, how a... The person being charged with prostitution would actually prove this. What Correct. The human trafficking victim would actually have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. What, what do you got to get your um, trafficker into court to say, well, yes, I trafficked? Uh, yes. Yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I have been trafficking this young lady. That is um, part of that? the, I mean, human trafficking is difficult to prove. And so, yeah, it does put somewhat of a burden on the victim that um, that was not in the original bill. And, and when you spoke earlier about just the dignity of uh, the victims involved, I mean, people that are coerced into into prostitution through um, human trafficking. I mean, that's a there's a lot of trauma involved in that whole experience, and now the victim has to come and make that make that case. And it's not real and, clear and to me how they would do it without bringing in the John, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, that that so in many cases, women who are brought here for the purposes of sex for the sex trade for, uh, through sure. human trafficking, mm -hmm. they might very well be right here and 
right outside the door is the United States of America, where she could actually go and say, hey, I'm the victim of sex trafficking, mm -hmm. and get help. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are organizations out there that would say, yes, come on, and we'll, we'll take care of you. But they might be from a culture in another country mm -hmm. where they don't know that. Correct. They don't know they can do that, because maybe they're from, they're from a place where you can't do that. Right, right. And so it's kind of a double whammy. They have to prove this, and they don't even know how to go about proving That's this, exactly or right. how to deal with our kind of system or, or the fact that we have due process, mm -hmm. or the fact that, that, they, that they're the victim and not the criminal. Correct. Right? Yeah, exactly. Correct. And I even think even knowing all that, there still is the fear. There would still be fear mm -hmm. and there would still, still be difficulty. There's still the fear of the um, sort of the, retali the retaliation that a John may take, or there's still, I mean, there's still some barriers. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's face right. it. So this thing yeah. uh, passed out of the Senate. Yes. Headed into the House. Correct. Right. Yeah. And see, you see a problem with this passing? I don't. I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't it, would be, uh, it would be. It would be, be bizarre. Yeah. It would, you know yes. what? I got to tell you. I got to tell you. I got to tell you. That would be. I would not be. I would not want to be the vote that killed this. Uh, to exactly. Be with you. All right. right. Yeah. All right. All right. So let, then let's move on um, to the needle prick bill. And let me just be clear. Needle prick is not my online screen name. It's actually what the bill does. So <laughs> I just want to make that clear. All right. It's not your uh, your Twitter that, handle. No, no, hardly. Okay. All right. So we have this ridiculous war on drugs, mm -hmm. and in the war on drugs. Uh, simply being in possession of paraphernalia that can be used to ingest these illegal drugs is in and of itself a crime. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So if I have a hypodermic needle in my pocket and there's, well, first off, simply being in possession of the needle itself is a crime, right? Unless I have a prescription for it? Correct. That, yes. That's right. right. And then if there's residue of an illegal drug on that needle, now I'm in possession of paraphernalia and an illegal drug. You can be charged with a controlled substance, even right. if it is just a residue. Okay, but here's the problem. When the cops show up on this, if, so let, let's just say that I'm, I'm homeless and drug addicted. That means I have a pretty darn good chance of coming in contact with the police at some point. In fact, mm -hmm. quite often, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And so then the police go to search me, stick their hand in my pocket, prick themselves on my needle mm -hmm. that I've been using and maybe sharing with my fellow drug addicts. And now, now what, happen, what, what happens? What happens? Take it from there. Well, there's a potential of infection, all right. kinds of things, and there are problems but, with that. I mean, one of the biggest selling points of this is it's it provides a, a good safety net for law enforcement yeah, or so first this, responders. So this right. is like, for, it, but it's not just cops. It's yeah, you're paramedics, right. first, it's, first it's responders, nurses exactly. in the hospital, uh, cutting someone's clothes off. You right. kind of only knows where you right. can come exactly. in contact with right. these needles. Right. And, and again, currently we do have participant exemption for individuals who are participating in syringe exchange programs. They are currently exempt. If they were to be questioned by police officers, they can say right. they can show their card and say, I'm a participant at a syringe exchange program, therefore they're exempt from the par paraphernalia and the controlled okay. substance if there's residue. That being said, there's only seven syringe exchange programs in the state of Colorado. So for the vast majority of the state and for people who are injection drug users, they do not currently have this exemption. So that if they are stopped by the police, they can be charged with paraphernalia okay. and a controlled substance. Then take me through the scenario that the bill fixes. So, I, so, I'm, so I'm in the park with my syringe in my pocket and the police are about to search me and I say, officer, I have a syringe in my pocket and, and, and it's a used syringe. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean that's and, and I tell him that and he says, oh, okay. So what happens now? Am I, am I now exempt from charges for, Ex for, for the possession of that syringe? Exempt from charges for the syringe and any residue. Now, if there's, if you have any other drugs on you or anything else on you, but, you so would still be charged. The, so only, but for it would, the, so it only specifically out. for that, carve out for that. You Correct. bet. And so, again, it's a preventative measure for law enforcement. There is a, a national st statistic that showed 30% of law enforcement at some point in their career will be accidentally stuck by a syringe, which is a, a large That's public a health number, issue. Yeah. Exactly. That's a big number. Exactly. All right, so I guess we can, and so this bill is passed out of the Senate. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's up tomorrow, it's up actually. Tomorrow. It's up so, well, tomorrow, so this, this show will be airing Friday. Oh, okay. So it's up Friday. It's our, right? Okay. Okay, great. Right. Um, so we can just call this bill the uh, a net reduction in drug war stupidity bill, basically. <laughs> yeah, I'm fine it, to call it that, Pretty yes. much. It, regard, I mean, it would be ideal to see a full decrim bill, but this is this is as good as we can get right now. Yeah. So can, I not, can I not go just go buy a syringe unless I have, like, a prescription for a drug that requires a syringe? Uh, no, so, uh, I mean, pharmacies just, no, can going, sell yeah. single syringes. Right. You, to, 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 to anybody? Yes. Oh, I mean, okay. th there's a handful. It's not every pharmacy, but there okay. are a handful of pharmacies, in particular in the Denver metro area that I'm yeah. from, aware of that can that sell syringes. Okay. Sounds good. Well, let's move on to the next bill. This is uh, sex assault reporting. Now, I hate going to emergency rooms, uh, not because they're just 
you don't want to go to an emergency room because something bad has happened. Right, exactly. They are the, the most intrusive places that you go into the emergency room with a cut on your mm -hmm. hand. And the next thing you know, you're getting hammered with questions. They don't want to just stitch up your hand. They want to know exactly what happened, how it happened, mm -hmm. et cetera. It almost seems as though healthcare providers have been co-opted into being basically proxies mm -hmm. for the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. And they're obligated to, mm -hmm. if, if, if you came in to the hospital and I was the attending doctor and you told me that you had been raped, and you, you were seeking medical, treat, medical treatment, I am currently obligated to call the police. Is that right? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. right. I, I was going to say that. There and even like if you said, please don't call the police, I am obligated as a, a as a licensed professional exactly. that I have to call the police. There are a lot of laws that have created these sort of obligations. Okay. So tell me what what's the workaround for this bill? What, is this, what would this bill undo that is currently being done? Well, so this bill gives a little more freedom and leeway for, for victims or for individuals who have experienced sexual assault. So. Uh, say somebody wants to uh, go through with an, a, a medical exam but may not want um, to participate in the law enforcement process. They can go ahead with that exam but say, you know what, I don't want to move forward. So this, that's one of the provisions in the bill. It also now allows... Wait a minute. Well, let's back up for a second. So will, will, the, will the health care provider be obligated to honor that? Be obligated to honor that... Her request? Um, as yes. far as I know, yes. So they can't go ahead and say, well, you know, we'd love to honor that, but mm, you know what, uh, I really think this should be reported. They have to. Right. In fact, that's essentially um, one of the carve outs in the bill, mm -hmm. right? Uh, what would otherwise be the responsibility of the health care provider suddenly becomes an exception mm -hmm. when okay. the sex assault victim says, hey, I'm not ready yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So no, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Yeah. Um, and then the other exception is that if someone wants to just report anonymously, like they don't have to, ver they don't have to Give disclose their name, the, their name or any information, but they still want to share that this that this assault happened, but they don't want to proceed with with the right with actually being named. And yes, that, right. And then you know it's another one that encourages, hopefully, you know, sex assault victims to come forward, but come forward on right. their own timing. Yes. Right. Because if you don't want, if you're not ready mm -hmm. to involve the authorities, you might be hesitant to come forward for treatment. Because you know right. that, correct? Because the the healthcare provider is obligated now to to call the authority. Right, and frankly, right. really, at the end of the day, it doesn't really give law enforcement a particularly good witness, right? I mean, mm -hmm. if you have someone who has to kind of be, sort of coerced and brought along, I mean, it's not necessarily the best sort of evidence that you can get from they a witness either. They don't want to be either. there, right? Right. So better to get the friendly witness, <laughs> right? The friendly um, victim who's going to make the you, charge. Do you, you see any chance this doesn't pass? I can't I imagine. <laughs> right. Again, yeah. and again, yeah. boy, what yes. I need to be, what I exactly. need to be the male uh, lawmaker <laughs> right. to kill this person. Right. right, exactly. Right, exactly. And again, because it hopefully will encourage people to report. Again, without the mandatory reporting there, if, mm -hmm. if people were fearful of, of reporting because of that, this will encourage more folks to come forward. Yeah. Okay. I would be remiss if, I, if we didn't do, as long as we're here, all here at the table, a eulogy for Senate Bill 6, <laughs> uh, <sighs> civil asset forfeiture reform, or as I like to refer to it, legalized government theft. Uh, rookie State Senator Laura Woods introduced Senate Bill 6, which mm -hmm. would have fairly significantly reformed our very predatory civil asset forfeiture laws here in Colorado. The bill died a bipartisan and tragic death mm -hmm. in the Senate Judiciary Committee. Correct. Bipartisan death. Also had bipartisan support, interestingly enough. Yes. Give, give, yes. give us the ACLU. The ACLU liked this bill. Mm -hmm. You supported much. it. CCA, JRC liked this bill. We uh, were involved with it, yes. Uh, Independence Institute liked this bill. We wanted to see it pass. The, by the way, you, uh, you weren't around in 2002, and I don't believe you were. And I was not, but it was the but two organizations. Yes, exactly. and so in 2002, uh, State Senator, uh, State Representative at the time, Sean Mitchell, yes. conservative Republican, mm -hmm. yes. State Senator Bill Thibault, mm -hmm. a liberal Democrat, mm -hmm. the Colorado Criminal Justice Reform Coalition, mm -hmm. the ACLU, the Independence Institute, <laughs> the Colorado Union of Taxpayers, <laughs> all came together right. and reformed civil assets forfeiture law in Colorado. Mm -hmm. What a great you don't bill. Get, yeah, really, what a great, what a great bill. By you don't get to take the whole bite at once, though. And right. so there was more that needed to be done. Right. And so 12 years later, Laura Woods introduces a bill to do some more. Mm -hmm. and, and it died. And uh, so I, I, but I think that it was important that we had the debate again, because it's been a long time. Mm -hmm. so there's a whole new crop of lawmakers who mm -hmm. had no idea what happened in 2002. Correct. There's a lot of uh, uh, people at the Capitol, lobbyists, et cetera, who don't understand what happened in 2002. Right. So I think it was valuable to have the debate again. I think Laura I Woods did a fantastic job I for do. a rookie. I want to give her uh, a big who, shout out. Um, she did a, a very good job, not only just in her stakeholder meetings and drafting the bill and, you know, and, and getting it on the hearing calendar, but her 
her presentation of the bill I thought was just terrific. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to imagine that it could have been defeated, frankly, right. <laughs> well, because right. it, was, it was very well done. And one of the things that the ACLU says all the time, right, and you tag the bill perfectly is, you know, who do you call when it's the police that are robbing you, right? I mean, this right. is a situation where it is. It's okay, legalized. Well, let's, but let's, let's, but see, you yes. said an interesting thing. A lot of people watching might be going, what the hell are you talking about? Right. So, so you, the police pull me over. I have twenty thousand dollars in my pocket, and they discover it because I give them permission to search me, or, or they search me, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they say, "Where'd you get the money?" And I said, "I, I had a great weekend in Vegas." Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. they say, "Hmm. Well, I'll tell you what. We're going to send you on your way because we have nothing to charge you with, but we're going to keep your money, and we're going to charge your money, and uh, we're going to. And I have to then go prove that I obtained obtained my money legally to get it back. They don't have to prove I obtained it." Illegally. That, that's fair assessment of what's going on at the moment. That's right. I mean, what typically happens, though, is, I mean, and, and the, the genesis of this whole civil forfeiture world was to not let criminals crime pay, right? So right. Uh, you would get a lot of money, for example, in a big drug deal. Yeah. And then why do you get to keep the money? So right. the whole idea is the government seizes it while they investigate further and decide whether, in fact. But we flipped it on its head. Look, oh, God, we're out of time. we got to go. Denise, <laughs> Terry. Thanks so much. How quickly that happens. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're closing so we can just keep chatting. And